The Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Today is the final installment of a four-part series featuring special requests and guest appearances by our mysterious patrons. Our patron of the week is Atticus, who joins us via Zoom. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, fellow Morals listeners. Atticus is a generous supporter of the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, and as a thank you, we've invited him to join us for a discussion of an episode of his choosing. Atticus, what are we going to listen to today? A Pride of Carrots from CBS Radio Workshop. In 1936, CBS Radio debuted a new series called Columbia Workshop, The network envisioned the workshop as an incubator for radio talent, a venue where artists could experiment with new ideas and techniques without the creative and budgetary restrictions of a sponsor. Twenty years later, the network revived Columbia Workshop as CBS Radio Workshop. This new version of the acclaimed series was designed to be just as experimental as the original. By the mid-1950s, television had all but replaced radio as the country's dominant form of entertainment. The network hoped CBS Radio Workshop could lure discerning Americans back to the radio with a promise of mature and innovative content. A Pride of Carrots was written especially for CBS Radio Workshop by American novelist and poet Robert Nathan. He is best remembered for his 1940 novel, Portrait of Jenny, which was adapted for film in 1948, starring Joseph Cotton and Jennifer Jones. Nathan's work was known for its mixture of whimsy and fantasy, A Pride of Carrots, a Swiftian satire about the first men on Venus is no exception. Like Aldous Huxley in CBS Radio Workshop's adaptation of Brave New World, Norman serves as the story's host and narrator. He is supported by a cast that includes Yogi Bear, Rocky the Flying Squirrel, Fred Flintstone, and Droopy the Dog, also known as June Foray, Dawes Butler, Alan Reed, and Bill Thompson. And now, let's listen to A Pride of Carrots from CBS Radio Workshop, first broadcast September 14, 1956. It's late at night, and a chill is set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music, and listen to the voices. This is the CBS Radio Workshop. Well, folks, that just about winds up tonight's broadcast from the interplanetary rocket ship American Initiative. If Commander Potter's astral navigation continues to hold as true as it has so far... I will be broadcasting to you tomorrow night at this time from the planet Venus, which even now looms dead ahead of us, brighter and somewhat larger than our own moon. This is J. Alexander Caudill, speaking for Caledonia Oil, Shirley White Toothpaste, Inus Kleinus Knock Beer, and Bar None Dog Food, and returning you now to the CBS studios on Earth. CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop. Dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, a pride of carrots, or Venus well served, by the noted American novelist Robert Nathan. And here to tell his story is Mr. Nathan himself. According to recent newspaper reports, scientists have been hearing strange and mysterious radio signals which they are convinced are broadcast from the planet Venus. And this may very well be the case. No one knows for certain that life exists on the other planets, but then no one can say for certain that it does not. And if it does, no one can say what form that life may take. One man's guess is as good as another's, and this is mine. This is the way Venus looks to me. Uh, 
feel good to scratch your legs again. It sure does. You feel heavier or lighter? Hmm? Just normal. Then the gravity's about the same as Earth. Look there. Hmm? What? A daisy. You can take off your helmet. You sure? Sure. The presence of flora indicates the presence of air. Quite good air, as a matter of fact. Yeah, that rocket was getting a little musty. Well, this is a solemn moment, Commander. It is indeed, Caudle, the first man on Venus. Hand me the flag, will you? Oh, here you are. I hereby claim this planet for the United States of America. Through the courtesy of Caledonia Oil, Shirley White Toothpaste, Inus Kleinus Knocked Beer, and Barn and Dog. Oh, really, Caudle, must you? Well, it's in my contract. But we aren't on the air. Uh, well, a little rehearsal never hurt anyone. Anyway, we will be as soon as the tubes on this walkie-talkie warm up. One, two, three, four, testing. One, two, three, four, testing. There we are. CBS on Earth from Caudal on Venus. CBS on Earth from Caudal on Venus. How do you read me? That's funny. They're standing by around the clock on this frequency. Earth from Venus. Earth from Venus. Come in, Earth. Maybe freak atmospherics. Oh, fine. At a time like this to run into freak... Potter. Yes? Do you see what I see over there in those bushes? Speaking of freaks... What is it? Well, it looks like a little horse. Yeah, but it's got wings and a sort of beak. And a tail like a kangaroo. And it's coming this way. Yeah, yeah. So where, where's the ray gun? I'll get it. All right, stand back, you filthy beast. Go away. Go away. I beg your pardon? I... You... You talk? Oh, naturally I talk. So do you. Haven't I seen you somewhere before? Certainly not. Oh, I'm sure I have. Oh, yes, on CBS. The outside of the inside of the news. You're J. Alexander Cottle. Do you mean to say you get our programs here on Venus? Venus? What do you mean, Venus? You're from Venus up there. Well, we call it the evening star at certain times of the year. But that's Earth. Nonsense. This is Earth. That's Venus. Silly, isn't it? But that's semantics for you. For instance, what would you call a group of carrots? Bunch. Bunch. Oh, good heavens, no. A pride of carrots. And that is, of course, on this side of the border. And a gaggle of onions. But if you were on the other side of the border, it would be an exaltation of onions and a deceit of carrots. Semantics, you see. It depends on your point of view. Uh, I see. A charm of griffins. You are a, uh, a griffin, I take it? Of course. Rather highly placed, as a matter of fact. Now, you notice my gold collar? I belong to the Secretary of the Interior. My name is Fido. And the Secretary? A very able carrot. Quite famous in his own right, but even more so for his wife's tassel. You've seen ordinary carrots, no doubt, with their green tops. But this is a most unusual tassel. Blue! Everyone is copying it. How does it happen that you, an animal, belong to a vegetable? Well, one has to eat. Vegetables? Oh, dear, no. Caraway seeds, truffles, marzipan... You look a little like marzipan yourself. You mind if I try? Uh, hey, cut it out. Stop biting me. Mm. You know, delicious, but definitely not marzipan. What is it? Meat, you fool. You don't say. Meat. I never tasted meat before. You'll meet yourself. I am? Splendid. I'll just try me. Oh, 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 that hurt. Of course it hurt. Now stop this nonsense and lead us to your master. Oh, yes, of course. That's why I'm here, isn't it? Follow me, fellow animals. They had not walked far through fields of charming wildflowers which sang like birds until they came to a shady bower of massive ferns. In the middle, reclining on a soft bed of lettuce leaves, were two carrots much like any other carrot you may have encountered, excepting that one had a tassel of the most brilliant blue. The carrot with a standard green tassel rose as they approached. Welcome to our planet. Oh, thank you. In the name of the United States Navy, oh, later, I... Pre- Potter, later. Uh, your Majesty, uh, that is, Your Majesties. Uh, we are not Majesties. This is a republic. I am Edwin, Secretary of the Interior, and this is my wife, Edwina. And you're the famous news commentator, J. Alexander Cardell, and your Commander Potter. 
Well, precisely, madam. We've been watching your trip ever since your takeoff, until we lost you when you rounded Mars. <laughs> You're most welcome. Well, thank you, madam. You can perhaps conceive the feelings with which Commander Potter and I gaze upon this unfamiliar scene. The first mortals ever to... What's that? Oh, that's my daughter Alice. She knows all the latest songs. She says she's a cool cat, whatever that is. Hi, everybody. Company? Yes, dear. Come here and meet our visitors from outer space. Mr. Cardle, Commander Potter. Oh, I know all about the mother. Welcome to Caratania, gentlemen. I have already welcomed them, Alice. Oh, you don't understand the animal kingdom, Father. They'd much rather be welcomed by a young girl. Really, Alice? Where do you learn such things? At school, in zoology class. And where did you learn that song? I watch your television all the time. I want to be a great actress and sell cigarettes. You think I'm mad? No, that sounds like a very normal ambition to me. Oh, I like you, Potter. You interest me. Now, Alice, you simply must stop this prattle. We're all a little on edge, I'm afraid. This last day of waiting has been... Well, after all... They could have landed in Onionopolis. But they didn't. The onions didn't get them. We got them. The onions? Yes. You see, our planet is divided into two countries, the Democratic Union of Keratania and the United Socialist Republics of Leeks and Onions. They are constantly threatening us with war. Well, why? They want us to be onions. But that's absurd. Of course it's absurd, especially when you realize that the only possible thing for everyone to be if he wants to live a decent kind of life, is a carrot. Oh, naturally. But the onions won't see it our way, and they can't be trusted. I'm given to understand that they plan to use nematodes. It's race suicide, of course. Nematodes? Let me think. Uh, well, aren't they the tiny worms that all but ruined the citrus in California back in the 40s? I don't know much about citrus. Not exactly my line, you know. But here, the nematodes eat vegetables, a kind of virus, too small to see. We've tried to outlaw them, but the onions won't agree. Ah, well, we'll wipe each other out, I suppose, and the spiders can take over. It's sad to think about. Just spider webs everywhere. You know, it seems to me that they worked out a way to fumigate for nematodes out in California. See, if I could just get through to CBS on Earth, I could find out. You've had difficulties getting through? Well, at any rate, Earth isn't getting through to me. I'm sure we could get you through on a planet-to-planet hookup, particularly if you can find out anything about fumigating for nematodes. Hey, Commander, you hear that? We're going on the air after all. Uh, oh, splendid. Do you want me to make a prepared report, or shall we ad lib? Well, you better type the report. You can ad lib to your wife. Oh, you have a wife, Potter. Oh, yes, my dear. Every Navy man over a full lieutenant has a wife. A woman, I presume? Oh, yes, definitely. Has to be, you know. What is your wife like, Potter? Why, uh, she's uh, female, like uh, this. How odd. Bumpy, isn't she? Well, uh... You're not bumpy, Potter. No, I, I suppose not. Yes, well, uh, Your Excellency, uh, how soon do you think you can get us on the air? We should be able to have it set up in a few hours. Well, now, my regular spot is 8.30 to 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. You, uh, you think you can make it? We'll do our best. Oh, great. Hey, this calls for a celebration. It's too bad we haven't a bottle of champagne. Champagne? What's that? Well, a kind of bubbly wine. Uh, wine is made from grapes, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure I like the idea. Some of our best friends are grapes. Yes, well, well, don't worry, ma'am. We haven't any champagne anyway. We could break out our emergency rations. Now, that's a fine idea. Got a can opener? Sure, right here. You uh, care to join us, Your Excellency? Well, I don't know. May I see that can, please? Oh, sure. Here you are. U.S. Navy for emergency use only. Concentrated carrot juice. Oh, oh I Potter, think I'm going Potter, to Potter, Potter, God, seize these men. Put them under arrest. They're onions in disguise. <laughs> Our scene shifts now to Onionopolis, capital of the United Socialist Republic of Leeks and Onions, which controls half of the planet Venus. We are in the office of the Secretary General of the Party, a large, fat white onion named Odor, as General Shallot enters. Death to carrots. Death to carrots. Well, General, the rumor has been verified by the underground. They landed near Caratopolis this morning. How did you permit this to happen, General? 
Unfortunately, our side of the planet was turned away from the direction they were traveling, so they landed on the backside, comrade. Excuses, excuses. We must have those spacemen, General. We must have their technical skill before the carrots get it or we will be in the soup. Yes, comrade. It is insufferable that we who invented television, jet propulsion, the atomic bomb and the bicycle should be deprived of these two men who can tell us how to use them. It is an outrage, a national insult. Death to carrots. Uh, likewise. I want those two spacemen. It may be difficult, comrade. You uh, could call me excellency or little father. Everyone does. I am a descendant of the garlics. A garlic does not call anything excellency. Of course, of course. I was only joking. Here we are all comrades. All excellencies, little fathers. Except leeks, of course. Of course. Death to carriage. Death to carriage. Uh, by the way, General, what are you doing tonight? Imperialistic warmongers. Nothing. Capitalistic schwein. Come have dinner with me. Decadent bourgeois. Love to. And those spacemen must be bourgeois too, or they would have landed here. Possibly. Undoubtedly, but we will change their point of view once we have made them our guests, eh, comrade? That might not be so wise, comrade. Why not? Don't you want to learn how to set off guided missiles and ride bicycles? That is not the point, comrade. If we abduct these spacemen, we give Caratania a splendid opportunity to protest. And you must remember, comrade, protests are weapons, too. The very best weapons. They cost nothing, and properly used, they create an odor. A real onion odor. Then you are opposed to kidnapping these spacemen. Definitely. Very well. I shall think about it. You could go, General. Thank you, comrade. Oh, by the way, I have news for you. You have just been promoted to field marshal. Thank you, comrade. Strength to onion. Strength to onion. See you at dinner. Death to carrots. I'll be there. Death to carrots, 8.30 sharp. Hello? Secret police? General Shallot has just left my office. Liquidate him. <laughs> I'm hungry. I wonder when they feed their prisoners in this lousy jail. What difference does it make unless you have an appetite for bone meal, ammonium sulfate, and peat moss? Ugh. Guess I'm not hungry after all. You shouldn't have shown him the label on the can, old man. That's what did it. Well, how could I tell? I thought it'd be chicken consomme. It usually is. Just when I had the greatest broadcast in history lined up. Now, now what? There's a lady to see you. Miss Alice. Shh, not so loud. Thank you, Sergeant. You can leave us now. Mind you, Miss Alice, this is contrary to your father's orders and against my better judgment. Oh, I know, Sergeant, but it's utterly divine of you. I shall be just outside. Scream if you need help. <laughs> you wouldn't hurt me, would you, Potter? I'm glad to have you aboard, ma'am. They say that you're dangerous vegetarians, that you eat carrots. Do you really? Well, you see, ma'am... I don't believe it. You're much too nice to eat poor little me. Thank you, ma'am. You know, you yourself are a vegetarian, Miss Alice. I am not. I'm a vegetable. It's not the same thing at all. Well, now, just answer me this. What will happen to you when you die? I'll be buried, of course, in the national compost heap. Uh -huh, from which the rich steaming soil is taken to nourish the young carrots, right? Of course. Which then must of necessity feed upon your decayed flesh. Why, of course. Why, how madly amusing. I really did eat my ancestors, didn't I? Oh, but I missed mother and father. Oh, I should hope so. But now what could be more satisfying to a girl's psyche than to have her father under her belt? Oh, have you been through analysis? Of course, haven't you? Well, yes. Oh, it's so nice to be able to talk the same language, isn't it? My analyst says the trouble with me is my mother has a blue top. Exactly. The active competition of an adult parent. It tends to make me aggressive. Kiss me, Potter. Huh? What? Kiss me. Good Lord, really, I... Are you afraid, Potter? It isn't even spring. I don't come into blossom till July. Well, I know, but, but... Am I not beautiful? Am I not to be desired by the Navy? Oh, yes, yes, indeed, but... I could have your head, Potter, on a silver tray, like Salome. I, I know, but... I could set you free. Well, for heaven's sake, kiss her and get it over with. No, but... <sighs> oh, you smell mm. so good. Like a grocery store. Oh, it's like April. 
Is this love, Potter? How can I feel this way about a carrot? I feel a strange heat. Not like the sun. Like a garden in the summer. I don't feel at all like a vegetable. I wouldn't have thought it possible. Look, how about getting us out of here? The time is up, folks. Oh, oh yes, I suppose it is. Oh, but don't worry, my darling. I'll be back. I'll be back quickly to set you free. You'll see. Well, there's the Navy for you. What have you fellas got that I haven't got? Blossoms in our hair. Ah. You uh, really like the girl, don't you? Yes. Well, now, of course, it's none of my business, but uh, what about Mrs. Potter? What about her? Well, she isn't going to like this pretty vegetable of yours. Caudle, could you be jealous of a stalk of celery? I am not married. No, of course, that does make a difference. Oh, I wish we were safe at home. There's something frightening about being in love with a carrot. You, you smell anything, Commander? No. That's funny. I, for a moment, I, I thought I smelled onions. Well, that's not very likely. I don't know. My eyes are watering. Mine, too. You know, I do smell onions. Gentlemen. Well, who are you? You are free, gentlemen. She did manage it, then. This way. Hurry, please. Where is she? I, I can't see very well. My eyes are full of tears. She's waiting for you, oh, sir. Just a minute, Commander. This isn't a carrot. It's an onion. Take them, comrades. So you see, gentlemen, we have no choice. The stakes were too high, being no less than war or peace. What are you talking about? Simply this, Commander Potter of the U.S. Navy. How do you make war? How do we do what? Make war. How do you destroy whole armies, cities, countries, with all their inhabitants, without, at the same time, annihilating yourselves? Unfortunately, there is no blight that will make compost out of carrots without doing the same for onions. I have to think of my people. Bless you, little father. Thank you, Spindle Skull. You see, Commander, we are still in the drawing board stage. We need technicians. Don't look at me. My dear Commander, you must understand that the end justifies the means. When onions rule the world... Who would wish to be a carrot? I offer you an important place in history. The only place I want to be is next to a girl with a carrot top who smells like a garden after rain. Now, 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 let us not grow emotional. But perhaps you are closer to her than you think. Will you teach us to make war, Commander? You see, I am giving you another chance. Opportunity rarely knocks so often. I will not. Very well. Perhaps we will find a way to make you change your mind. There is a little experiment I am planning with a pot of boiling water. How would you like to see your, shall we say, girlfriend floating about with only a marrow bone for company? A quite excellent soup, petite marmite, I believe it is called. Sure, bluffing. Am I? We shall see. Spindle. Yes, little father. Take these gentlemen to the solarium and entertain them. Show them the vampire marigolds and the lizard-eating oleander, and they might be amused to watch the muerte vine digest its daily mouse. I warn you, Odor, the United States Navy will not take this lying down. Nor will CBS. This way, animals. Send in the other prisoner. Well, well, come in, young lady. Don't be bashful. I won't eat you. What do you want with me? Why did you bring me here? I suppose you wouldn't care to tell me the whereabouts of the Carrot Eight Army. No? Oh, you, so stupid, so impulsive, so desirable, but so uncooperative. By the way, your friend Commander Potter is here. <gasps> He, too, has proven uncooperative. We may have to press him a little. He wouldn't dare. He is being shown the muerte vines at this very moment. Not the meat eaters. Why not? The commander is meat, I believe. Oh, no, no, not that. Of course, I could be persuaded to change my mind. Oh, you have such lovely skin, my dear. 
So moist and tender. Please. You smell good, too, like a salad. Fragrant, but delicate. What freshness, what youth. I adore you. I loathe you. You do not realize your situation. One word from me, you are in the soup. I would a thousand times. Or what is perhaps more to the point, your friend Mr. Potter is left alone with the vampire marigolds. Oh, no, no. Oh, 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 that fetches you. You really care for him, don't you? More than life. All the better. It's much more more exciting to make love to a woman already in love. It adds a kind of seasoning, as it were. You, you nettle, you noise and weed. Splendid, splendid, so sweet and so hot, almost like a Spanish onion. Is this the way you make war on women and children? War? Who is making war? I'm making love. You are odious to me. Very well, we will try, Mr. Potter, in the muerte wise. Oh, no, 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 I, I can't stand it. You give up? You give in? Will he have a safe conduct back to my father? Yes, yes. Will there be one for me? Later. Write it out. But of course. For Mr. Potter, a pass. Also for Mr. Cordell. And now for Miss Alice. Yes, Mrs. Father. Spindle, you will let the spaceman go. And you will see that this lady is returned to her own people. Later. It shall be done, little father. Now, divine creature, at last you are mine. No, no, stand back. Silly girl, drop that paper knife and receive the kiss of the little father. No, no. <laughs> it is thus a carrot kisses. Alice. Oh, Potter, Potter, thank heaven you're safe. You're crying. It's nothing, nothing. It's only onion juice. Here are your passes. Go quickly, both of you. And you? I must wait for a little while. If I go with you now, they'll be suspicious. No. If we have to die, then we'll die together. Oh, no, no, my dear Potter. That wouldn't help my country, or this little world, or even me. I've become very sensible, Potter, very realistic. Don't you see? It doesn't matter about me. But you, you, Potter, you're the hope of the future. Look, I'll try to catch up to you at the frontier. If I don't come, be kind to Carrots, Potter, for my sake. Go now, and God bless you. Come on, Potter, we're on the air in an hour. Hurry, hurry, they're coming back. I'm staying with you. No, no, my dearest Potter, go. Go, the world needs you. The universe needs you. Come on, Potter. Farewell, then, my dearest Alice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of Earth and other species throughout the planetary system, this is J. Alexander Caudill, bringing you the very first broadcast from Venus. Through the courtesy of Caledonia Oil, Shirley White Toothpaste, Ines Kleinus Knock Beer, and Bar None Dog Food. Oh, uh, ex excuse me a moment, ladies and gentlemen. There, uh, there's some confusion here in the studio. We, uh, we've just received a bulletin. What's that? Oh, no. Alice? In the soup? Uh, and I'll need a pound of peas. Pound of peas. Uh, and a cauliflower. Cauliflower. You must be very happy to have your husband back again, Mrs. Potter. And all those write-ups in the papers, my goodness. Did he really get to Venus like they said? I missed the broadcast. Yes, he did. Uh, a bottle of ketchup. A bottle of ketchup. Mm -hmm. You know, he looks a little thin in his pictures. I guess maybe they didn't have much to eat up there. Um, I guess not. What was it like? Did he tell you? He hasn't said much. Uh, four dozen onions. Four dozen? That's right. He, he eats them all the time. Raw. Raw? <laughs> they say onions are good for colds. I know. There's lots of things like that, like carrots make your hair curly. Oh, he won't touch carrots. He won't. Not even cooked. Not even cooked. I served a petite marmite the other night, and he got up and left the table. No. Now, isn't that something? Uh, one sack of uh, peat moss. What's that for? He, he says he's got blossoms in his hair. Hmm. 
Uh, that'll be 347, Mrs. Potter. I'll have someone take them out to the car for you. Thank you. Goodbye now. Blossoms in his hair. In February? <laughs> The CBS Radio Workshop, produced in Hollywood by William N. Robeson, has presented A Pride of Carrots, or Venus Well Served, by Robert Mason, with the author as narrator. A Pride of Carrots was adapted for the workshop by Mr. Robeson, who also directed the production. Heard in the cast were Helene Burke, June Foray, Tracy Roberts, Dawes Butler, Ted Bliss, Richard Hale, Alan Reed, Sam Pierce, and Bill Thompson. The original score was composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith. Next week, from New York, the workshop will examine that so often discussed and little understood subject, the Oedipus Complex, with illustrations from Sophocles, who first dramatized it, to Eugene O'Neill, who is by no means the last to probe its dramatic depths. For Mozart's Concerto for Piano and Orchestra in A minor, played by Robert Casadesis, and for Elizabeth Schwarzkopf's moving interpretations of songs by Richard Strauss, join us on Sunday, when on most of these same stations, world music festivals will be on the air, with highlights from the famous Salzburg Festival. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News, to be followed over most of these same stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. was A Pride of Carrots from the CBS Radio Workshop here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And that is not only a selection picked by our Patreon Atticus, but Atticus is joining us on the podcast. Once again, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. Where, where do you hail from, Atticus? I hail from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, from, but from all around the world, actually. So I was born in Idaho, grew up in West Virginia and the Bronx, where my father was from, lived in Pennsylvania, then I moved to Holland, then I moved to England, uh, then I finally boomeranged back to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And is that where you are right now? That is correct. Yep. Not many people see the entire world and settle on Pittsburgh. <laughs> Should I be insulted and hang no. up? Uh, no. No, I'm just kidding. I like Pittsburgh. It's, it's probably not a lot of people's first choice, but um, I think, you know, having seen the world, I wanted to come back to some place that was comfortable. Well, I'm, I'm right there with you, someone who's lived uh, all over the United States, and I keep coming back to Minneapolis. This is where I want to be. So there you go. Uh, Atticus, we have some icebreaker questions here that we like to ask our guest hosts to sort of uh, gauge uh, where you are in your thoughts and feelings about old time radio. So are you ready to answer a couple questions? I'm ready. All right. If you were trapped in a lighthouse with nothing but rats for company and a single old-time radio series to listen to over and over again, what would it be and why? Okay. Let's pretend I didn't prepare these in advance. Um, (laughs) I think what I was thinking here is I wanted to see how far we could flex the rules. Um, While I'm sort of a passive consumer of old-time radio, I like the feel of it. I like the way it kind of wraps its arms around you. So I can't speak to all of the narrative nuances and construction and things like that. So I wanted something with variety. So I opted for uh, saying, hey, can I have first-person singular, Mercury Theater on the air, and Campbell Playhouse? 
as one mm-hmm. entity. And then if I was pushed uh, really hard by you guys, uh, I'd settle on uh, Campbell Playhouse because it has more episodes. Right. Smart. If you were an angry, fickle god, what old-time radio show would you wipe from existence? I'm just not a fan of cowboy and western radio programs. I'm almost a fan of the old-time movies that are they're westerns or, or cowboy genre. Every time the Lone Ranger comes on, I have to turn the <laughs> dial. I just can't. I just can't get my arms around it. That's fair. Yep. And no one else should be able to enjoy something you don't enjoy. That, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wipe it out. I will say give Gunsmoke, just give it a shot. Okay, I will. Do you have a burning question you would like to put to your mysterious old hosts? I'd like to know actually what the most challenging aspect of bringing to life um, and performing live a new radio play. So something you guys create. Well, since Ooh. I am currently staring down the barrel of a deadline, I would say the hardest part is actually writing the script. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> <laughs> you get to, you have to just sit alone in a room with a blank page. Um, and since we also do recreations of old-time radio shows, it's kind of nice when you someone else has already done all the work. Right. And you can just say, how do I want to make this happen? A lot of the stuff that I write is either episodic or uh, mystery-based. For me, the hardest part is, yes, what Joshua said, the writing, but making sure I'm filling in all those cracks of, okay, does this make sense? Did I set this up correctly? And then solving the mystery, you have to solve mysteries backwards. I I like when I write things to have them go, oh, of course, those clues were dropped. That's really hard to write. And I have written myself into horrible corners and have had to do things like, um, oh, it turns out they were all dreaming just to get out of it. (laughs) Because we're also, we work like from script idea all the way through production. Um, Sometimes I know it's walking the line of, I want to innovate some idea of like, this production is going to have some crazy new thing we've never done before. And we we can't do that. We haven't done it because we can't. Right. (laughs) Versus we keep doing the same thing over and over again and never innovate. So it's trying to find that new thing that we haven't done but we can do. Last of all, we have to ask this because you're a patron and uh, there might be other people out there thinking, should I give these guys money? Uh, Why on earth do you give your hard-earned money to this ridiculous podcast? Assuming that it's hard-earned. (laughs) always harder yes but it's well worth giving it to you guys i think you guys help us all bask in the glow of mysterious old radio i really like the way you guys hone your craft and you i really appreciate the different views you bring to assessing each episode um you all have a different thing you like and you bring that and i think it really helps us all understand the different dimensions of old-time radio yeah i'd be ridiculous not to give you my hard-earned money <laughs> it's much appreciated. That's our next piece of swag. It's a coffee mug that says, I'd be ridiculous not to give these people money. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on to your choice. Now, I should let listeners know that uh, Atticus had asked me for some ideas for old time radio that had a Cold War element to it. And so I sent him a number of episodes ranging from more straightforward action fair to uh, more allegorical sci-fi to more absurdist material such as the one Atticus chose for us today, A Pride of Carrots. So with that in mind that you had a selection presented by me, uh, why did you choose this one, Atticus? Well, I I just felt like the others were sort of standard fare. I think they were probably better in the long run, um, but I thought this one, it left me with a bigger impression. Um, Whether that's good or bad is for us to discuss. Uh, But I think it's like, it's undeniably Red Scare or Cold War-esque, while still kind of recalling some of the goofiness of cartoons I remember watching when I was a kid on reruns. I didn't catch any of the uh, Red Scare... (laughs) parts of this i it was whew. we'll just have we'll have to go into that for you eric and i forgot there is one last reason why i picked this because if i'm honest i figured eric would hate it um and so i thought that would <laughs> that would generate a, a, a lots of interesting discussion wow are you gonna be happy with my reaction then atticus <laughs> <laughs> so 
remove your personal taste from your assessment <laughs> of this, because obviously this is not your taste in what you would sit and listen to old time radio no. and try no. to think, does it succeed for what it's attempting to do? And then feel free to go on whatever rant you want to go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did do that, actually. A couple things. First of all, again, whatever we're doing, we just kind of send them out to each other with no setup. And so I very frequently just click and go, oh, it's time to listen for my prep for the radio show. I like doing it that way without prepping so that I can go, I wonder what it's going to be. So imagine there's always that, I don't know, six minutes before I go, oh, it's a satire. So for five and a half minutes, I'm like, well, this is just terrible. You're the, <laughs> you're the, you're the worst astronauts ever. <laughs> like, and, and then when you go, okay, satire. So Joshua, just so you know, that what happened there. Okay, okay, Eric, calm down. It's satire and it's political commentary. So approach it from that angle. So I did do that. Yes, not my cup of tea, but let's think about it for what it is. And I'm going to tell you that I found the breadth and depth of the analysis of it to be somewhat ridiculously shallow. Using vegetables and all that is not awakening me to any kind of anything where I go, oh, that's an interesting viewpoint or the interesting take. Unlike Animal Farm, for example. And I'll be honest, it's really hard to get past I am listening to the Rocky and Bullwinkle show and Fractured Fairy Tales guy, and it's really hard. Hard because you don't like Fractured Fairy Tales? <laughs> I do like Fractured Fairy Tales. It's just Don't start a fight. <laughs> I'm not meaning to pick a fight. <laughs> those, those voices are forever linked to that, so it's hard to pull out of that. And, you know, I know I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about kissing a carrot and what that would be like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Joshua, to answer you, I did do that. I swear to God I did. And I came away on the other side saying, no, that really wasn't my cup of tea from that angle either. You actually brought up a point that I was going to make about this is that I think the political satire is all on the surface. And Nathan yeah. actually just starts the scene with the griffin and pretty much tells you it's going to be a political satire with the whole discussion of semantics and point of view and how like, oh, really? On Venus, we're Earth and you're Venus. Um, that right. uh, all these big human conflicts are just differences in points of view. And then he just tosses it away. And I don't think that's necessarily right. a bad thing because I actually just enjoy how silly it is. But he's far more interested in playing in the ridiculous sandbox he's created and making vegetable jokes than he is about making too many political points. It's a gentle satire. They favor broad, um, getting a lot of targets rather than getting deep on any one target. Right. So like, it's a shotgun. I mean, it's also making fun of mass media, which is big at this time. Obviously, the fact that the aliens all li listen and watch CBS. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that the astronauts are are obliged to show up and say their advertising slogans. Yeah. The right. future will be sponsored. <laughs> I, uh, last Christmas, was given a gift of, do you remember those mad uh, paperback books? And I was given a, four or five of them from the 60s. Like, Don Martin's look at whatever, you know, whatever oh. those little things were. Anyway, so I got them. I like, love Don Martin. I was like, oh, yay, nostalgia. And I read them through all of them. And boy, they just don't stand the test of time. There's a reason I'm telling you this. I was reminded of that style of Mad Magazine and those things throughout this entire episode of how they were doing the comedy, of how they were doing the satire. The whole thing read like 60s Mad Magazine. Does that make sense? I loved this to pieces, <laughs> and I thought it was hilarious. The onion back and forth, that it was just always in it. Death to carrots. Likewise. <laughs> Hands down, okay. worth okay. the price of admission. The death to carrots scene, the whole onion scene is everything yeah. to me. I will give you that. <laughs> death to carrots made me laugh. That's the thing that's stuck in my head. Death to carrots. Death to carrots. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we could sell on our Threadless store shirts that say death to carrots. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I heard this, uh, along with my great many cats I own. I also have two rabbits. And now every time I give them a carrot as a special treat, I just <laughs> lean in and go, get two carrots. And then they go, chomp, 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 and just tear into this carrot. Uh, <laughs> get two carrots. <laughs> oh, they were willing to go back twice for the she's in the soup uh, joke. 
So yes. Eric made the Mad Magazine comparison, and what this um, reminded me of is this very certain brand of comedy that was somewhat prominent in the 1950s that uh, it probably has some academic term for it, but what I think of as dry absurdity, if that makes sense. But the situations and characters are really over the top, but the delivery is blunt and deadpan and somewhat naturalistic, even if they're doing big character voices. Um, I, it, it reminded me of Bob and Ray or Nichols and May, for example, even though subject matter was more absurd. It had more of the, as we said, fractured fairy tales in space. But that's what it made me think of, and I think that's where it was successful for me. The exchange with the onions really had a Nichols and May quality to me uh, just their delivery back and forth especially when they're making the dinner plans and they're like capitalist dog you want to go out to dinner <laughs> <laughs> decadent bourgeois yes i'm in so what did you like about it in particular atticus i mean i think the impression when i was listening to it i think the thing that i tried to project was what it would be like to listen to it at the time and that's why I thought it was the most interesting of the those that I kind of considered having us listen to. Um, it felt like an, a very average kind of goofy thing that something that might be on and that the family might be listening to in the evening. And I think er, I agree with Eric. It's kind of hard to get past the, the very well-known voices in it. So I felt like it was the audio track of a cartoon. It was very average. And I think that was perfect. It's exactly what I was looking for because... <laughs> And I know you guys, we, we, you typically do that. Is it a classic? Does it stand the test of time? Um, so I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I thought it was of the time. Oh, I completely understand that. And we frequently, you know, have to stop and do that and say, all right, does it stand the test of time? No, but what about at the time? What are the circumstances that are going on? You know, we frequently discuss the emotion of the country at the time for a certain episode and what things are going on, be it them war or depression or whatnot. So one of the things I thought about Atticus was when I said, okay, it's political satire, recalibrate your brain. <laughs> this isn't a really good X minus one. <laughs> I actually did send Atticus an X minus one too. So <laughs> we came close. <laughs> I thought about the idea of what this be something that at the time I went, oh, that's really a unique way to do political satire. And of course, I don't know enough about the history of, was this a first? Was it a trope at this point? So that would also play into it. It really does carve out a unique space where there's, it's a lot of different authors are sort of close to this, but not quite this. Like uh, Roald Dahl has satire like this, but it's not like Roald Dahl. Little Lewis Carroll in there as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the daughter's name is Alice. There's a lot of Alice in Wonderland qualities here. Uh, it reminded me of uh, Evening Primrose. Yep. And all these things like it's sort of like that, but it stands apart from each of those things. There's so many great lines in here. I mean, they're not super great. I think it's one of those like quantity over quality. It's this um, mood, the whole episode creates and the rapidity of these absurd ridiculous lines being passed back and forth but there's some standout ones i love when alice says am i not beautiful am i not to be desired by yep. the navy <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the timing of it is pretty fantastic um and uh, tim and i work together in a grocery store so someday soon at work i'm gonna uh, turn to tim and i'm gonna say you smell so good like a grocery store. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. I have one nerdy thing here, and that's with the list of sponsors. One of the sponsors was Eins Klein's Knocked Beer. Is that real? No, it's Mozart. Okay, I mean, I thought that was just part of the satire. It was just... Right? Okay. Eine Kleine Notch Music mm -hmm, is, mm -hmm. yeah. is Mozart. And what I found funny is that, as always happens... Every joke eventually becomes real in the future. And I Googled, and there is a Canadian brewery that has this beer. It's a lager. I think it's called Eins Kleins Nacht Lager. <laughs> well, that's when you open it, and it goes... <laughs> it's, it's a little night beer. So I thought that was quite funny. Uh, in the in the just sort of synchronicity of what I've been doing the rest of my life, I was recently watching uh, on HBO Max, there's a a documentary series about late night television shows. It was interesting to listen to this and compare it to the ongoing sort of evolution in late night talk shows of 
being timely and political or not. Right. And because they're like every single day, they're always just inherently a little bit timely. They have to be. Um, but for a long, long time, they definitely avoided being political to make sure that it was a pleasant way to send you off to bed. Right. And I, I thought this was of that. I mean, like, it's timely, but it's not it, – the stakes aren't that high. It's a little bit of fun. Yes. There's also a tremendous moment that struck me as very funny where the horse, I believe, eats the astronaut. Oh, the griffin. Takes, <laughs> yeah, the griffin takes yes. a bite of the astronaut – You know, I've never had meat. And the astronaut's reaction is, hey, 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 ow, hey. (laughs) (laughs) There isn't, there isn't a, holy God, you just took a bite of me. I am bleeding. I will die. No. I'm the first human bitten by a griffin. The reference, the feel, I should say, to Alice in Wonderland, when this thing first started, I really wasn't sure if it was going to be political satire. I mean, it obviously turned into Cold War political satire. But for a while, I just thought, oh, this is like a, a going down the rabbit hole to Venus, you know, where everything is just weird uh, for weird sake. I would have preferred it stayed there. Also, the ending was like vaguely bittersweet, which is weird. Of like, oh, this this romance of Earthling and Carrot. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh. And you can tell he's not really interested in the political end of it as much as he is as just the silliness sure. because he we end on his earthly grocery list later in, right. <laughs> when he comes back <laughs> and he wants no carrots and just to eat as many onions as possible. <laughs> Did you have a thought when, you know, the, the falling in love with the carrot, a thing on the formal board, forbidden love? <laughs> <laughs> no, but now I can't get it out of my head. <laughs> 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 I wanted to make sure at some point in this discussion I said about the Onion characters that they have a lot of layers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, death to carrots. You couldn't fit it in naturally. No. So you <laughs> had to make sure, okay, I didn't get a shot at my joke. Here it is. <laughs> and, and that right there is why I'm a Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tim, tell him stuff. <laughs> Can't end it better than that. Uh, let's let's throw it to the vote, shall we, everybody? Uh, let's uh, give honors to our Patreon and guest, Atticus. What is your vote on this? I definitely think it is not a classic. It almost stands the test of time, but it's definitely of its time. I'll just go next. I agree with that 100%. I think it's of its time. I don't think it stands the test of time. It's not aimed at me. Uh, so I have to pull myself out of that and say, I don't like it, but what is it? I have to analyze what it is and not be so dismissive. And even for what it is, I didn't find it fantastic. But I did laugh about five or six times, and I think Josh was right. I think that really was the point. Let's just – more Mad Magazine is the angle and making us laugh at the parody than making a point. And so it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I would say it does stand the test of time because it is a really nice blend of absurdism and satire that as a fan of comedy, I really appreciated both that it was funny and that it it really uh, blended those two genres well in a way that I enjoyed. Yeah, it's definitely not a classic. I like that he's more interested in amusing than challenging the audience. I do think it stands the test of time because I do think that silly but smart, broad but deadpan, contradictory elements smashed together are just really, really appealing. And I think representative of the 1950s, but something that still exists today and is recognizable as a strong vein of comedy to tap. Um, I I wish more people did it, but I loved it. Thank you, Atticus. Mm -hmm. All right, Tim, tell them stuff. Hey, if you liked this episode, you can find a whole lot more of them at ghoulishdelights.com or wherever you get your podcasts. But if you do go to ghoulishdelights.com, you can also uh, leave comments. You can vote in polls. Let us know what you thought. Send us messages. Let us know what episodes you want to listen to, um, which we won't stop you if you just want to listen to them. We're not gatekeepers of what you can listen to. Um, (laughs) You can also link to our Threadless store, our social media pages, and our Patreon page. Yes, you can go to patreon.com slash the morals and support this podcast like Atticus. He is an example. He is a role model 
And you can uh, maybe even end up on the podcast. Who knows? But uh, please, we have a lot of fun. Uh, we just got finished before recording this uh, with our monthly happy hour. Atticus, that was your first happy hour. Yes, Did you it enjoy was it? awesome. Yes, it was great. Great. Like-minded people um, and getting to engage with you guys. He gave the right answer. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yes, go to patreon.com slash the morals and support the podcast. If you'd like to see us perform live, Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society is also a theater company that performs recreations and adaptations of classic radio dramas and a lot of our own original work live on stage. You can come see us. We perform monthly somewhere. Just go to ghoulishdelights.com or mysteriousoldradiolisteningsociety.com to see where we're performing live Uh, and what we're performing this month, and how to get tickets, either in person or online. You can watch anywhere in the universe. (laughs) So if you're a carrot... (laughs) Death to carrots. Death to carrots. carrots. (laughs) And uh, before we wrap it up, Atticus, thank you again so, so much for everything you've done for us and for uh, being with us today. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Joshua, what do we got coming up next? Next uh, is a special gift from Tim. That's right. It's the holiday season. And because I haven't done it yet this year, I owe each of you a special gift episode. So we're going to start that next week with an episode I'm not going to tell you about quite yet. So until then. Look out! Is it foray or foray? Anybody? I don't think it's foray, but I don't know. Do both. Do both, yeah. Also known as June Foray. Also known as June Foray. Can you do it in a robot voice so I can just drop it in like, Also known as June Foray. (laughs) (laughs) Also known as June Foray. That is how it is pronounced in robot. (laughs) All right. Are we ready? Uh, And no.